One of the nice things to say about Haas is we don't make energy drinks, we actually make machines that also happen to make Formula One cars. So we make those, but we also make those. And those can make those. And, and nobody else can say that, and it's really quite a nice story. Hello and welcome to uh, another MTD podcast. Um, today I am at Hass's uh, workshop in Leicester. I've got uh, James Leet with us from Hass. I've also got Lindsay Vickers and uh, Giovanni Albanese from MTD CNC. Um, I'll be hosting today's podcast. I'm Paul Jones, the founder and managing director of MTD CNC. Uh, and I've got to say, I'm really pleased to be doing this podcast today, actually, back here at Hass in, in Leicester. Um, I think the last time I visited here was probably about four or five years ago. Uh, so I'd like to welcome, firstly, James to uh, the podcast. Hello, James. How are you doing? Hi, thank you. Yes, very good. Thanks. Now, you had to travel a long way to get here to Leicester today? Not too far. No, I'm just over the Cambridge border, so about an hour and a half for me. Okay. Now, your, your main facility from Haas is obviously up in, in Norwich, isn't it? That's right. Yep. Yeah, but you do have the, the other facility in Banbury too. We do, yep. Yeah, so pl plenty of places to go where you can see uh, Haas machines. Now, we'll be talking uh, throughout today's show about a, a machine that we've got behind us uh, here as the podcast, which you won't be obviously able to see because this, um, this is not being filmed. But it's the ST40 machine, and we've been reviewing this uh, lathe today. In fact, we've done lots of, uh, lots of good content, which you'll be able to find on our YouTube channel about the machine. Uh, at this point, of course, I want to welcome my colleagues, Lindsay and Gio. Um, which one of you two wants to go first? Gio was pointing at Lindsay there. You're right. <laughs> yeah, I pointed back at Gio. I'll go first. Poked each other. I'm well. Up. All is good in my life. I've got one question: Hass or Haas? Well, we'll come back to that in a minute because we'll, we'll we'll get James to answer that because he's probably <laughs> the best qualified. The he's probably the best qualified <laughs> to do so. Uh, Gio, how are you keeping? Are you all right? Yeah, very well, thank you, Paul. Uh, lovely to meet you today, James. Um, it's yeah. great to be back at this facility. It brings back a lot of memories used to visit this facility like Paul over five, over five years ago uh, but yeah it's nice to be back now in the, in the show I said we're going to be talking about the ST40 but of course we're going to talk about all the other machines that are under the Haas umbrella we'll talk about the application support the service team uh, we'll talk about what happens in, in the states new technologies that are coming along and also the fact that Geo has programmed a Haas machine and used one in the past haven't you which I didn't know until today 20 years ago though Paul I'm not an expert 20 so what, years ago what, just give, it, give our listeners a bit you don't even look of, old enough <laughs> You must have been five. You must have been a child. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you. Give us, um, let's keep going. Keep abusing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a compliment. Yeah, it is. Um, so what did you do on a Haslade, Gio? Just tell us, what were you making? So, yeah, so when I got into the aerospace industry, I was a tool maker before I went to an aerospace company in, in Coventry, um, and they had Has machines, and it was critical uh, aerospace landing gear. Uh, so landing gear. So we were doing them on a, a VF2 SS at the time, um, and I can remember coming to this facility and having my programming course with Malcolm. Um, it was very easy to pick up because it's very compatible to FANUC. Um, and, and today, you know, we've really seen some massive evolutions um, in, the, in the software that, you know, wasn't there back 20 years ago, albeit the control system does look very similar. Mm. Uh, James, uh, maybe set the scene for yourself, really. Tell us about uh, yourself and what you do here at Haas or Haas and maybe answer Lindsay's <laughs> question. <laughs> Um, well, uh, I'm currently a regional director covering this area on the sales side of things. I've had several roles within Haas over the last 10 years. Uh, COVID changed the landscape for lots of uh, organisations. So, yeah, I'm, I'm currently um, heading up the sales operation in Leicester, Nottingham, Cambridgeshire, that, that kind of area. Um, over to the, the Haas Haas tomato tomato um, personal preference per well I think uh, do you know what I think it is because if you're enamoured with the brand and you want to call it Haas we're not going to argue with you over that um, Jean Haas of course I said it then as a Haas because yeah. Jean would say Jean Haas uh, sorry Jean if you're listening uh, uh, that attempt at an American accent but is that American? It, it is an American <laughs> kind of tone to it but of course even in the UK some people have a bath some people have a bath yeah. um, I hear Hass a lot more I think I, I think most people yeah. kind of go Hass uh, yeah. and it rolls off the tongue but um, the purists will say Hass um, I just say look fine if you want to sign the order form call it what you want <laughs> that's tricky one. one for me I don't pronounce my H's very well James let's 
for those that don't know, and in fact, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot we're going to we well, I'm, I know we're going to learn a lot on today's podcast. But Hass itself, where did it all start? And I mean, it's some some tremendous success story, isn't it? When you consider where it started and where it is to, to it, date, it really is actually, and and it's totally down to one man's vision and drive, and that is Gene Hass, and he's still very very involved now, and very lots. But lots of people now recognise him from Formula One, of course, so he has become this kind of global, recognisable figure. But literally, it started way over 30 years ago. Gene was manufacturing some rotary products, so fourth axis rotary. And um, he decided at that point in time that trying to sell fourth axis kit onto other people's kit was one thing, but why not evolve their own three axis VMC? So... Uh, they put their minds to it and came up with a VMC that was very successful. Uh, he called it the very first one or the VF1. See, because, I didn't know that until today. Yeah, I know. It's, it's crazy. There, there, there is a, there's a, a lovely story behind it. You know, they, they designed it, got it out there. It clearly worked and they didn't have a marketing department. So they thought, what, what will we call it? It's the very first one. We'll call it the VF1. <laughs> and of course, from there, it's just, it's just exploded to this massive range. And, um, still to this day Gene owns the whole thing lock stock and barrel in the states the manufacturing facility is absolutely his vision and he's still very very hands on he's an engineer um, obviously he's a very good businessman but he's, he's absolutely an engineer and he's still very interested in the product and he obviously loves Formula 1 otherwise yep. he, he wouldn't have got in it so, so what happened there? Um, again I don't want to get the full details wrong clearly but yes Gene has had uh, an overt passion for motorsport and, and has been involved with NASCAR and I'm sure he saw the business opportunity to get the brand around the world globally I'm sure that was on his mind but um, I, I think and, and having spoken to him personally about it he clearly has got passion for F1 he did say quite publicly that it surprised him how very technical and complicated it was compared to NASCAR but um, yeah it, it, it's done wonders I think for brand recognition. Do you not find though that many engineers are into their motorsports and uh, you know in that area they're, they're fascinated they're making machines so it's quite a natural progression to go into it as well but he's kind of then evolving with. Uh, absolutely and it's a it's a nice story it's part of the narrative actually around the involvement with Haas machines and F1 because uh, Gunther Steiner, the team principal, actually owns some Haas machines, which people don't wow. realise. So um, a few years ago at the Banbury Centre that you mentioned earlier, I saw Gunther just playing around on one of the demo machines that we've got there and walked up sort of slightly concerned. Are you all right there? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I've got one of these. And uh, he, he's playing around with the new control. So there is a link. And, yes. um, and for sure, engineers love things that... Are made from metal and parts and yeah. go fast and and vice pushing versa. Pushing the boundaries. Absolutely. You're pushing the boundaries with these machines. They're pushing the boundaries with those, and they're making them on their <laughs> machines. I mean, yeah. you couldn't you well, couldn't say anything much better than that. No, and it's a really nice story because obviously, with all of the other Formula One teams, they are marketing businesses, of course. And one of the nice things to say about Haas is, look, you know, we don't make energy drinks. We actually make machines that also happen to make Formula One cars. So we make those. But we also make those, mm. and those can make those, and, and nobody else can say that, and it's really quite a nice story. Special. And has it had a big impact? I mean, we talk about the, the marketing side of it. Has biz I mean, business has gr grown anyway, but has this made a real difference? Has it accelerated growth, the awareness now people have because of the F1? Yes, I'm going to say absolutely yes, and the evidence for that, globally certainly. So one of the objectives with F1 is to get that, branding globally recognized in the uk we've had a bit more of a head start so the couple of things that are different about the uk first of all we were the very first agent to ever export Haas from america so that's quite a nice stat and and the same three people that set that company up 31 years ago own it today so we were the very very first dealer outside of the us so that's that's quite nice so our branding you could argue is somewhat accelerated compared to some of the rest of the world the other thing is in the uk of course there is a very knowledgeable f1 fan base um more so than than certainly the far east which are kind of new to f1 so we we've had to be a little bit more cautious about how 
we not not how hard but how we push and market the f1 side of things and i think the the response has been tremendous because customers have felt invested in something and i've seen the evidence of that from open houses that we've had in um, banbury when you guys came yeah, and did a, yeah. a lovely film shoot there actually Roman and, yeah that's right and, and kevin magnuson yeah. and and a, again it's just really quite nice to see the customers feeling that they've invested some physical cash into that brand and that brand then appears on a formula one driver's livery that they're stood next to having a chat to and it and it kind of it's different well, it's you, very you, different. you talk about roman how lucky was he uh, not so long ago and, oh, wow and, yeah. and and this this really i mean it's conversations we had last week while we were doing another podcast about the safety critical element of f1 and how things have improved haven't they yeah i mean that's testament to terrific engineering it, it really is and actually when you look at uh, a really controversial development which was the halo and roman was quite against the halo he, he was why was he against it? I, I don't i don't honestly know but he was vocally kind of don't like it maybe you know not pretty i don't know but but he was one of the sort of um not so keen drivers but that absolutely saved his life and i'm sure if you asked him again now what do you think to the halo yeah. um if he wasn't impressed his wife would be i'm sure <laughs> um, but i mean wow <laughs> you know we've all we've all looked at it none of us understand f1 like the f1 engineers but um what a thing to walk away from and i don't think even five years ago somebody would have walked away from that with just minor burns on their hands it's it's incredible are you getting as a business lots of new um technology uh boosts if you like through through your work with formula one um i guess to an extent in that we do supply an awful lot of formula one companies with uh, kit uh, you know, even Mercedes in the UK buy an awful lot of our five axis machines. Uh, and having our own team, I guess, enables us to experiment with some of our own kit behind closed doors. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not involved with that part of it, but I'm sure it must go on. So to a certain extent, Joe, I think yes is the answer to that. But obviously the, the technology advancements in Formula One going faster isn't really relevant to a vector drive in the back of a st40 lathe for example but uh, yeah it, again we don't make energy drinks we make things that make formula one cars so there is a link without a doubt yeah. and, and do you think that it's down do you think geo's the right size to be a formula one driver i think he could probably get in um whether he'd get out without pulling the wing mirrors off again is another <laughs> thing we, we, we did a podcast in fact last week and i found out a stat that that shorter people on average live two years longer their life expectancy is two years longer than a taller person that's good news Paul. but it doesn't make sense because there's a contradiction in this somewhere because chinese don't have the longest life expectancy over the the, oh. the country mm. so in fact one of the tallest countries in the world which is netherlands have the best life expectancy yet they're saying that short people i think it's all that. down to food oh food you i agree you i agree you, you are what you eat i'm 100%. gonna i've got a few um questions for you so hopefully you've been learning today boys um right so geo i'm going to ask you so has claimed that they have the most popular um machine globally sold what machine is it the vf2 yes well done that's impressive. How many of those do they make a day, James? Oh, no, no, no. That was my uh, next one. <laughs> that was my next Not one. Not to me. I know the answer to that. Do you know the answer? Please, <laughs> miss. Please, miss. <laughs> you know the uh, answers. You told me them. I'm, I'm going to say 20. He knows. He knows. It is. We've been very well educated like today, and, and it's been great to, yes, to learn so have. much, James. Have you got That's any more been... facts? Oh, loads. Go on then. The podcast isn't that long, is it? No, so. but give us some because I think there's some. You well, know, you've been going over <clears throat> 31 years. It's in yeah. the UK. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. It is, and and we've sold in that time way over 10,000 machines now into the UK. So, um, you know, when the brand first emerged, it was viewed, I think, with some cynicism. You know, is it? Uh, a, a part-time machine is it a, a machine that's going to not stand the test of time or a, a, almost a disposable machine because of the price point that it came in at but we we're still going out to machines that we installed 30 years ago um they're still running in workshops to this day which is a testament to that what, so where, where do you th where do you think the market is then for the Haas machines i mean the the, the, the brand is so so or the 
the range is so vast, isn't mm. it? Um, and you, you mentioned cost effective in a lot mm. of your material, in your marketing mm. material. Is this where we're sort of p- positioning ourselves? In? Yeah, that's a, that's a great word, actually. I, I, I use it all the time about positioning. So, um, yes, the range is vast, but actually it, it's spread over a very, very few families of machines because we want that manufacture of uh, or, or scale of manufacturer economy to come into the build so we make an awful lot of the same parts that fit a range of machines and that helps in many ways obviously it gets the base cost of the machine down but also the cost of replacement spare parts and also the ability to hold a concise inventory of parts for when machines do need replacements or breakdowns or crashes and you know is, it is, happens, it, is this the secret to kind of being able to sell a, a machine at the price point that you do well I, I think so but it's about understanding your position in the market so one of the things that has have never claimed to be is the best lathe on the market for accuracy or or the most robust slide way for heavy milling or we, we've never pushed ourselves into a, a specialized slot but then when you look at the uk market it is predominantly a subcontract market um, we are a nation of full of subbies so that really talks to the Haas brand perfectly because we do a nice range of very fit for purpose vertical machining centers. That's what we're known for. That's what we started with. We've now got a very nice range of slant bed lathes. And none of these are specialist in any way. Um, The parts are very uh, accessible for years and years and years. We can still service, as I mentioned, a machine that's 30 years old if necessary. Um, And that really talks to the subcontract market because they don't know what they're going to be machining next week are there limitations though because i know on your vf range all of the spindle speeds are 8100 rpm are there limitations or do you have then choice do you have variables for people to go actually i want more i want less or does it just work and where does 8100 come from well it's american of course isn't it so uh, our rpm um is is converted to uh, um, yeah, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Rotations <laughs> gotcha. per... Yeah. But uh, yes, the standard spindle, you're right, Lindsay, is 8,100 RPM. Okay. Uh, one of the nice things about a Haas claim is that if we say it's 8,100 RPM, that's what it is. Um, it's rated higher, it's restricted to that. Therefore, if you want to run it all day at 8,100 RPM, the warranty covers that. There's no caveat of, oh, you've got to cool it down for a bit now. But of course, with modern technology, with modern cutter technology, we need to go faster. So there are other options. There's 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 You have got the options. The options are definitely there, but they're standard options as well. Because again, what we don't want to do is start to produce a lot of special things because with every special thing you manufacture is another set of special spares you have to hold and where what we've what we've been very successful at doing is to hold a range of common spares that we've always got access to and on the on the range itself your turning machines when when did you start producing those because like you said vertical machining centers and milling was first Mm -hmm. when did the turning hit hit the ground um, turning hit the ground some time ago, actually, a couple of decades ago. But the, the very first um, lathes that came out were designated HL, so Hass lathe, likes to keep things simple. Um, and people may still remember, and I know there are still some out there, HL2, HL4. And, and candidly, um, Hass were then really experimenting with the turning market. They were a milling machine manufacturer and did a, a cracking job with that. And, um, you know, we we learn lessons in business and and when Haas release a product now it's very very tested um before we get anywhere near it and and the Haas lathe range has evolved people will remember and still see the sl range which was slant lathe mm. now uh, and for the last 10 years or so we've been on an st range slant turn um and that machine is is far far more advanced than the original Haas lathes that have come out and we've got a lot of, of lathes now our, our market share of, of lathes is growing it used to be lathe sales compared to vertical sales used to be around about 80 20 in favor of vertical and, and that that is somewhat changing now so we're, we're, we're growing more market share in lathes than we had 
We've had the pleasure today to, mm. to review the ST40, um, and it's a fantastic lathe, but you only just brought to market not that long ago your fifth axis machine tools. Mm-hmm. How, how have you found that marketplace, and how, how, what kind of market share have you been winning with, with them? Personally, I think the UMC range or, or utility machine, the, the five axis machine, UMC 750, is one of the best products we've ever, ever released. Um, and you say recently, it's probably five or six years ago now that yeah. we put the first UMC 750 into the UK. Um, we resisted actually putting it in straight away because we wanted to learn how to install it, how, uh, and that's crucial. With a, with a five axis machine, if it's not installed properly, it won't work. Um, and, and people fall foul of that all the time if they buy their own independent second-hand machine, for example, and then try and install it themselves. It, it's not the same as installing a, a basic VMC. So we, we had to learn ourselves how to fix these things, how to install them before we had the confidence to sell them. Once we did that, wow, has it been a success. Um, I don't know the numbers, but we've sold hundreds of We see them UMCs. everywhere. Yep. Absolutely everywhere. And I, I remember standing in this very spot, in fact, <laughs> mm-hmm. when the machine was first mm-hmm. launched uh, and doing a review on it. And yeah, like you say, it must have been it must have been six years ago, five it, or six it, it years ago. It would be, yeah. And uh, of course, now the range has evolved. There's UMC 750, there's the SS version. There's, there's the U- automation. UMC 1000, UMC 500, UMC 1500 Duo. Uh, there's, there's so many... Um, advancements to the range you say that's the best machine so far why why is it okay yeah good question so i I say that because um it's introduced us into a different market for sure um it's positioned ourselves with credibility in that five axis arena and that's then unlocked the door for other machines so people that would not have considered perhaps a vf2 or an st10 of have bought a UMC 750 because of the price point and what it can do for them and thought, wow, this this experience actually of dealing with Haas is quite good. Let's buy a VMC, let's buy a lathe, let's do that. So it's opened doors to people that previously would not have entertained us because they thought, well, you know, we're into five axis. We don't, Haas are not really a supplier to our business. We need to be looking elsewhere. Suddenly, wow, we, we can't ignore these guys. Now, the other really nice thing about UMC is that despite the fact that we've sold hundreds of them, We've rarely had to go back to one under warranty. Of course it happens. It's engineering. You know, that there are always going to be warranty issues. The more stuff you sell, the more you have to go back to. Um, but as a, as a new machine launch, UMC has been very, very sort of cost effective in terms of return visits for us. Uh, as a business and and that actually says an awful lot about the quality mm-hmm. um, when when's when's uh, the uh, turn mill machine going to arrive then james when do you think has to go into <laughs> that market it's just it's one area that you look at and we see all of your machines yeah the five axis turning centers vmcs even tool room lathes you know yeah. mini mills where's turn mill or mill turn as it's called well there's a couple of answers to that. So the first one would be ask Gene, and while you're at it, ask him how to pronounce his surname, and we'll get that one covered off at the same time. Um, but, <laughs> but, yeah, actually, I mean, one of the things that that has to do very well is they want to keep running with proven technology. So when the UMC was launched, it was a fairly easy transition in that. The spindle that's in a UMC is the same spindle as in a VF4SS, for example, or, or any of the VF range. The linear rail technology is the same. Um, the encoders are pretty much the same. So um, then you look at the rotary element of that and you take one of our TR450 uh, rotary products. The technology in that is pretty much the same. It was then a question of integrating the two. Now that's a benefit, why? Because first of all, you're not entering a marketplace with a brand new product that is unheard of or or untested. So that gives us the confidence. But also, again, it comes back to that economy of scale of manufacture and less spare parts to carry. We carry the same spindle for a UMC as a VF. Um, When you go into that turn mill arena, that is a complete, that's a little bit like saying, uh, going back 20 years or so and saying, right, we're going to make lathes now. It's completely different. Has a very, very successful at selling a lot of machines. 
and, and that's the marketplace they want. Um, so if they think they can sell 20 VF2s a day, why would they then break that line down to make one of something else that they may or may not sell next month? I'll make 20 VF2s, thanks, because that's what we're good at. We'll stick to our knitting. And that's very much how how has of operate i think it's it, it's it's well the the numbers of obviously obviously speak for themselves mm. you know they they speak for themselves not just in the uk but around the world um and going back to the programming which we alluded to at the beginning of this podcast the actual programming um control system looks exactly the same as it did 20 years ago you know you, you you're just not like only you. just like you well, just like me like a like Look, a fine wine, fine wine like a fine wine <laughs> uh, but the the <laughs> The, what the point I'm trying to get at really is is that mechanically, you know, machines can only evolve so much mechanically. Are all your um, technological advancements now coming through the software? And why have you kept the same control system as you did um, from back, you know, 20 plus years? Mm. Okay, so there's a couple of points there. Yes, you're absolutely right. Some evolution through the control system. Um, is inevitable and um, that's there's some easy gains to be made from more powerful software more strategies coming through from CAD CAM programming for example what the tooling boys can get up to now um, means that we have to keep up with with different cutter path technology and everything else there is a lot you can do with the machine still um, and one of the things that has to do is we use Haas machines to make Haas machines so we get a lot of feedback from the operators so the machines are always built with the operator in mind um, so silly little things happen where an operator may make a mod of their own on a machine to make their life easier. The factory pick up on that, suddenly it'll become a standard feature on a worldwide sale machine. With the control, um, you're absolutely right. Things have evolved massively on the software side. Um, however, the buttons have never moved. And again, that comes to not so much a programming benefit, but an operator benefit. So if your operator's happy, your operator's usually more productive. And the operator has a lot of influence on what the boss buys, because he wants to keep his workforce productive. So by moving the buttons around, all it does is just throw an operator, and it means that they have their favorite machine to work on, and they won't go and work on the other one in the corner. If all of your controls are exactly the same, in terms of button layout, whether it's a mill, a lathe, old or new, it's so easy. Um, and the operators really like that. Plus the fact that if you're interviewed, there's a big issue at the moment with, I, I hear it all the time, if you could sell me an operator, I'd buy a machine. Where are the operators? Not not the setters and the, pro where are the operators? So it's a basic interview question, isn't it? Um, have you ever worked a Haas machine? Yes, end of conversation. You can work mine then, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Even if, like you say, it was twenty, you know, it yeah. was twenty years ago. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, I can't believe we've almost been talking for half an hour. It's it's been a right. fascinating podcast. But what I do want to um, dive into now is the service side of things. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's come across very um, strongly today from all you guys at Haas is it or Haas it is about the uh, the service element, and and you want to fix it first time. Mm. Can you tell us about that because it's a such a big point for engineers when they're investing in, in capital goods like this. It, it, it really is, and, and it's something that we're constantly working on and don't take for granted that it's a, it's a constantly evolving problem. We, we obviously want all of our 10,000 plus spindles to be working, but inevitably um, things happen. So um, we understand that it's really, really frustrating when your machine's down. And, um, you know, we... we have looked at this for years as to how the industry not just us can can service engineers better we we decided a long time ago that um, the main objective is to get that spindle running not to get an engineer out there as soon as possible to only then look at guessing what the problem might be diagnosing probably three or four faults ordering a few different parts from country of origin and then let's keep our fingers crossed that they're the right parts when they turn up and then several visits later we're still chasing things around so we, we wanted a system where we can pretty much diagnose quickly what the problem is either over the phone or with a visit but 
how on earth are we going to fix it first time? That's where the parts come into play. So for a long time, we've had um, engineers carrying parts on vans. But what we also found is that if we carry a central stock in Norwich, that can often be sent there quicker than a van can get there. So sometimes, actually, if we're unsure, we'll send a range of parts in so that when the engineer gets there, he's got a range of parts to pick from. But again, they're not specialist machines. They're, these parts are generic parts that will fit several different models of, of Huss machine, which gives us a fairly good fighting chance of fixing it on that first visit. Because you've got over £7 million worth of spare parts, I believe. That's right. Uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, uh, anyone time Over in 30 engineers on the road. Um, that's just in Norwich. That's the Norwich stock holding. So there's some more. There's, there's usually about about thirty thousand pounds worth of um, parts in the in the vans overnight. But um, the, uh, the the van policy is, is changed slightly because obviously the other thing we don't want is the liability of thirty thousand pounds worth of stuff in stuff. the back of vans. So um, and, and yeah, we've we've changed the uh, the fleet of vehicles very recently for the engineers' comfort as well. So. Oh, that's interesting because I used to have near where I lived. There used to be a Haas service engineer because yeah. there was always a van, um, you know, hovering around. So they're not in those anymore. Well, no, because the other thing is there's a real consideration about some some of them are. There is an integration um, period um, uh, or, or a changeover period, but of course, getting out in the winter time, um, a, a, a van, a, a Vito van, is not always very practical when you're in North Yorkshire trying to get up a hill. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, so yeah, we've gone gone toward the pickup truck area, uh, which obviously allows them to carry loads and loads of tools, some parts, uh, and it's more like driving a car and, and a little bit more conducive to to safe driving in winter. Good, good. Oh, go on, Lindsay. Go. Oh, no, I was just going to say, after speaking with your colleague earlier, often when we do, um, we do interviews and we get chatting to you, we kind of understand some of the key messages that you're saying. And I think what was really strong for me and I'd learned is the fact that, you know, no, no one knows a Haas machine better than a Haas engineer. And the fact Very that, you, true, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, sometimes we're kind of feeding people with lines that they've kind of already talked to us. And, and it's interesting that when you say about service and support, your engineers are making these. You, you've got your sales team have previously been engineers and applications yep. guys anyway so it's engineers speaking to engineers and I think that was a real key message that I picked up on from what he was trying to allude to is mm. no one knows these machines better than your own team so just phone us we're one phone call away and we're going to fix it because we know them better than anybody else yeah and that's really strong message it, it is and, and they're kept constantly up to date because um, not many people realise that the, the engineering team actually are constantly monitored and tested. They have to do an open book online test regularly to keep their knowledge up to date and they Paul have to that pass with it. Us. Paul does that with us at yeah. MTD. Yeah, 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 I've heard that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> they never pass. <laughs> <laughs> not, not one has ever passed. <laughs> but, but you're right, Lindsay, as well. I mean, all of our sales guys now, with the, with the exception of one or two, have, have come through the applications or service routes. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a real empathy there. What, uh, what, what that means is that the sales guy doesn't overpromise to get a sale yeah. because they've worked on these machines they've installed these machines so managing the customer's expectation is absolutely crucial yeah. to winning that trust um, and back to the umc point that you made where we sell one we generally then sell more um, and that happens because of that trust piece and the empathy through through the technical sale well i think yeah you get the first machine in there and the sales person predominantly sells that machine but mm. the second third fourth fifth sixth seventh machine usually comes from trust service support yep. Um, yep. and uh, I've, I've learned so much and I can only echo what Lindsay says I, I think and, and you've just mentioned about kind of bringing your guys up through service applications because you know they know the machine so inside out and if you don't know the machine tool inside out it's very difficult to sell a product that you're not really that familiar mm. with so I think it's a great business structure that you've got there Good stuff. Um, James, thank you very much for accommodating us today. You're very well. Uh, it's been a terrific podcast, but there's also, as I said at the start of this, there'll be some um, great videos on our YouTube channel that we've shot today uh, on the ST40. There'll also be more videos up and coming where we'll be visiting some of uh, Haas's customers to find out um, you know, whether what James is saying you know, is 
hundred percent right. Which Don't take my word for it. Ask <laughs> which them. I'm yeah. sure it is. <laughs> which I'm sure it is because we've done plenty before. So, uh, yeah, thanks for you all joining me today. That's been it for this week's uh, MTD podcast. Thanks for listening to the MTD podcast. If you found value in this episode, please subscribe and leave a rating and review. Find more episodes on mtdcnc.com.